I'm really fascinated by Io. When you think about all of the Jovian moons, they're all kind of similar. Icy moons with some kind of water ocean, that's fine. But Io just lays it all bare. It is just like volcanoes across the entire world, blasting into space. It looks like it's just covered in sulfur. It's an amazing place and it is just poorly understood. Now we got an amazing flyby from NASA's Juno spacecraft that gave us much better images of Io, including a lot of places that we had never seen before and showed just how much active volcanism is going on on Io and possibly some kind of global magma ocean that's connecting all of these hotspots together. My guest today is Dr. Ashley Davis. He is a volcanologist at the Jet Propulsion Lab at NASA, and he has been studying Io as well as the other Jovian moons and just this interface between rock and water and eruptions and sort of in all of its sort of forms and phases. Now he's one of the proponents behind the Io Volcano Observer Mission. This was one of the missions that NASA was considering a couple of years ago. In the end, they went with a couple of Venus spacecraft and not the Io spacecraft, but it's still being proposed. It's still making its way through the system and who knows, we could see emissions. We talk about some new discoveries on Io and what this tells us about sort of the solar system in general, about maybe the search for life, as well as as we start to understand exoplanets. We also talk about the Io Volcano Explorer mission and what it could be and what could come after that. A lander, rover, lava tubes, it's all in there. All right, here's the interview with Dr. Ashley Davis. Ashley, if I could stand on the surface of Io, which is probably not the smartest move right now, um, what would I see? Uh, you would see a vast expanse of sulfur and sulfur dioxide in the form of frost on the surface. Uh, and if you're really lucky, you'll see silicate lavas erupting onto the surface, spectacular lava fountains, huge volcanic plumes stretching up hundreds of kilometers into space against the backdrop of mighty Jupiter in a yeah. night sky. I mean, I think about like, all we have are these pictures from orbit from Galileo and it, you know, the pizza moon, it looks like this weird yellow blobby thing. And I know we have some like volcanic places here on earth with a lot of sulfur in it that look kind of similar. Like, is there an IO analog here on earth? Um, you can think of an analog as being I think the best place on Earth for, for an IO analog is, is somewhere like uh, Iceland, where we have a lot of fire, a lot of ice. We have lava erupting through and onto uh, ice and snow. And that is an analogous process to what we see on IO, where some of the plumes that we see on IO are the result of, of surface ices being mobilized by lava flows flowing on flood flowing over them, so uh, uh, th that that's a pretty good that's a pretty good analog for what we see. Um, we also see places on Earth where a lot of sulfur is erupted, and these are secondary deposits that are mobilized and erupted onto the surface. Uh, we see this in Japan. We see this in uh, in Hawaii. In 1950, there was a big sulfur eruption, uh, almost pure sulfur, almost 100% pure sulfur. Um, it, this was fumarolic sulfur that, that over many years built up the deposit in the crust and then lava, silicate lava, basalt close by in a, in a very high temperature state mobilized it and it just flowed across the surface, it flowed out and onto the surface, quite magnificent. Um, and we, and that, that almost certainly happens a lot on Io as well because the, the upper part of the crust is rich in sulfur and sulfur dioxide. Well, you talked about this idea of it being kind of similar to Iceland with volcanic activity coming out through snow and ice. I mean, is there ice and snow on the surface of, of Io? I mean, it, all the other moons have plenty of ice. It's, it's not water. It's, it's, frozen, it's frozen sulfur and frozen sulfur dioxide, both, both, uh, oh, both wow. uh, you know, common volcanic materials in terms of you know, stuff that's incorporated into magma and over over geological time, this stuff is built up on the surface of Io in, in, in thick layers, and it gets buried by, by plume deposits, and gets buried by lava flows. And so we have a, a, an upper crust, the upper part of the lithosphere that's very rich in these volatiles. 
And these are important drivers to the styles of volcanic activity that we've seen on Io. I, I grew up in Vancouver, and for the longest time, there were these giant piles of sulfur in the port. And I'm not sure what they were, I guess used for the logging industry or something like that, as I think about it, like all of the, the paper mills stink um, and like sulfur. <laughs> and, um, but they're just these giant yellow piles and they use them for uh, TV and movies because they look like alien landscapes. And I'm sort of imagining that, that you're like running around in a pile of sulfur. That's kind of what you would be seeing staying out on the surface of Io. Yeah, I, I, that's, yeah, you know, uh, you have a lot of sulfur and sulfur dioxide there. And we know that the surface of Io is very rich in sulfur dioxide and it's frozen into a frost. Um, and uh, it covers you know, just about all of all, all of the surface of Io. I mean, the 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 lava that erupts out of volcanoes um, only cover about about two percent, three percent of Io's surface. And the rest of it is very rich in this in this sulfur and sulfur dioxide. So generally, everywhere you get sort of high temperature, calling it high temperature, basalt, ultramafic, perhaps ultramafic lava, um, very high temperature, well in excess of, of 1400 Kelvin, um, you get this stuff running across the surface uh, and, uh, and, and interacting and melting and mobilizing and driving away the, the, the sulfur dioxide. Of course, there's also sulfur and sulfur dioxide uh, dissolved in the, in the magma itself. So as it rises up from depth and pressure decreases, this stuff exsolves out of solution. Um, so now you've got a gas trapped in a column of you know, incandescent rock, and this expands and accelerates these, these, uh, the, 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 the magma to the surface where it erupts out, uh, sometimes at, at very, very high velocities, you know, up to a kilometer a second. Uh, by this point, the magma has, has fragmented into, into tiny clasts because this thing is erupting into a vacuum. And it, it, the thing I love about volcanology um, is that uh, you can take the, the, the physical processes that you see on Earth and, put, and derive what the physics is driving it and what the mathematical models are that fit the data. And then you can apply all this to IO. All you have to do is change the environmental, procedure, uh, the environmental pr uh, parameters. All you need to do is change the environmental parameters so to, to simulate the environment and see what changes you get. This was a, a huge revolution in, 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 in the understanding of planetary science uh, back in, the, back in the, uh, the 70s and 80s and 90s onward. Uh, it changed volcanology forever. So you recently published a paper where you counted up the number of active volcanoes on the surface of Io right now. How many volcanoes are there going on Io today, probably? Okay. Um, yes, at the moment, we have identified in, uh, in Juno Giram data, uh, 273 individual hotspots on Io. Um, wow. Most of these are standalone volcanoes, individual volcanic centers. Uh, some of these are grouped, and some of these hotspots are grouped together at a single volcano, um, but basically on the order of about 200 and uh, 260 to 270 individual volcanic uh, eruptions are taking place on Io right now. What Juno has given us, uh, the Juno mission has given us, is this incredible snapshot of the global picture of Io's volcanic activity. And give me a sense of scale. Like you said, some of them are kind of clustered together into specific, like around volcanoes. But sure. like, how big would would the a small hotspot be by your count, and then what's the biggest one? Um, the smallest features that we see are probably on the order of a few square kilometers in size, but they're very hot. So we have something that's going on that is, that is releasing a lot of uh, of hot lava, and it's at a high temperature, and uh, and so we can see the radiated heat against against the very cold uh, background. Um, one hotspot in particular that comes to mind is Prometheus, which has been known for a long time. It's, it's kind of like the old faithful of, of, of Io because it was seen as a hotspot early in the, in the Galileo days in 1996. And it's basically been seen in every, uh, every uh, 
observation by any asset. I could detect it ever since, both spacecraft and from telescopes on the ground. And Prometheus is fascinating because um, we see a hot spot at the vent. We know where the vent is, and we see that lava is coming up at the vent, and it's creating a small plume and deposits around the vent. And then the lava flows about 110 to 120 kilometers mm, westward, uh, and it's laid down this large lava flow field. But the lava flows we, we see next to the vent and along the lava flows are actually quite kind of cool. We don't see any thermal emission from those or very little thermal emission from there. But we see thermal emission at the end of the lava flows. So what we, what we think is happening is that lava is coming up at the vent and then it's flowing along a lava tube system over 100 kilometers long before erupting onto Io's surface, where it interacts with the ice that's frozen, sulfur dioxide and sulfur, and creates a, a volcanic plume about 80 to 100 kilometers high. But the scale of volcanic activity on Io dwarfs contemporary activity here on Earth. We see lava flows, some of which cover hundreds of thousands of square kilometers. It's just astonishing. It's an astonishing volcanic laboratory that that I just I just can't get enough of. I just I just really enjoy yeah. <clears throat> trying to understand what's happening. Oh, you know. But and, and at the small scale, cool world. like how small? The small the scale. Uh, Again, yeah, you know, it's the question is, you know, how, really, it comes down to you know how big is a volcanic eruption? It could be really small, um, uh, and. We see these these eruptions on, on taking place on Io, which are very rare, which just completely dwarf anything that's ever been seen on Earth uh, in human history. Um, but uh, but you know, in in Earth's distant past, played a, a major role in shaping shaping the surface of the Earth. At the small scale, well, there's the limit of detection. You know, we get down to a point where there might be smaller hotspots taking uh, small eruptions taking place, but we don't have the sensitivity of the observations to to detect them. Um, at the same time, there has to be a limit just because you can't get a tiny amount of lava up to the surface. And that's the same on Earth as well. You, know, you don't have tiny eruptions where you have small, really small uh, volumes. That, that, there has to be some sort of limit where you need enough, enough oomph, enough magma rising up to force its way through the crust, to work its way through the rock and through the other material up to the surface before it can, before it can then erupt. And so you propose in your paper that there is this global yep. magma ocean that is linking all of these hotspots together. We, yeah, um, it, it's one of the things that we propose. And basically, if you think, if you look at the work that's been done over the last 20 years and try to understand what really makes IO tick, um, th there are a number of sort of end member models. And one of them has a lot of tidal heating, uh, concentrated deep in Io's mantle. Uh, another model has it concentrated in uh, at the top of the mantle, at the base of the crust in the asthenosphere. And a, a more recent model has uh, the idea of a global magma ocean, or at least a, a very extensive, longitudinally extensive uh, region of melt. Um, uh, and what we find in our in, in our analysis, we looked at the the distribution of hotspots, and we found some some very interesting results. Uh, before Juno, stepping back one one bit, uh, one step from this, um, prior to the Juno mission, just about all of our observations of Io's volcanoes were in the equatorial plane, and that's from spacecraft and from ground based telescopes, and you know even from James Webb you're looking at Io in the equatorial plane, which means we don't have a good view of the poles of Io. So there was always uncertainty as to what was happening there because we, we never had a really good look at the thermal emission coming from the poles and with instruments that we could use to detect uh, volcanic activity. Now Voyager, remember the Voyager spacecraft, Voyager 1 flew part through, through let's see, Voyager 1 flew, through, uh, flew past the south pole um, of, of, of Io and sent back some superb images that have never ever been bettered you know, of, of the structure. But they didn't have a thermal imager on board at the wavelengths that was sensitive to most of the thermal emission coming from active volcanic activity, uh, from active volcanoes. So we've been limited in our understanding of what was happening on Io because we couldn't see what was happening at the poles. And this is the glory of Juno, the Juno spacecraft 
in a polar orbit around Jupiter gives us repeated images of the poles, both north and south. And that's what enabled us to basically complete the picture. So we can see all of Io, we can see where all the volcanoes are taking place. Now, before this happened, before Judo got these incredible observations, the understanding was that we could see these large, we'd see, we could see large eruptions taking place in, in the, upper, the upper latitudes. The thought was, let me just start that bit again. <laughs> Prior to, to Juno sending back these incredible images, um, the understanding was that perhaps Io had different styles of volcanic activity in the polar regions where there were uh, uh, larger uh, eruptions, but there were few, few of them. Um, and what we find is that the, the eruptions are actually just as, just as, uh, as common in terms of the number of volcanoes that are actually there per unit area as at lower latitudes, but they're actually less energetic than, than what we see uh, at, at low latitudes. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference in what we see at the poles. And going back to the question of these different, these different models of where Io is being internally heated by, by tidal forces, um, each one of those models has a different pattern of resulting heat flow, and by inference, a different pattern of volcanic activity. So what we find is that the pattern that we see in, 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 the, in, in the thermal emission from these volcanoes is more supportive of a global magma ocean or the shallowest thenospheric heating than it is of deep mantle heating. So this doesn't mean that there isn't any deep mantle heating taking place, but the preponderance of, of, of heating is taking place at, at, at lower, uh, at um, uh, shallower depths. Um, there could well be a global magma ocean. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's literally completely molten. All it means is that it's, it, it could be the, the various pockets of melt are actually interconnected. If you think about water moving through a sponge, you have a situation where it's not necessarily a liquid ocean like, the, like, a, like a water ocean uh, under the ice crust of Europa. Uh, it, it could be a, a uh, just just interconnection, which allows the, the movement of fluid, uh, or, or it could actually be fully 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 molten. In which case, you could actually have a, a the, the, the shell of Io, the outer shell decoupled from the from the interior. Oh, that's interesting. So, like, I had sort of imagined it that you had like with the Earth. You know, we have a solid core, we have the mantle, and then we have the crust, and sure. you have yes. pockets of more liquidy material on the mantle um, that is erupting in volcanoes, but you don't get just constant sure. eruptions from the entire mantle all the time. And so I was sort of envisioning it like it was a layer where you were getting sort of global magma. Yeah, and it might be that. That, okay, might, okay. Be, that yeah. might be what we're having. But, uh, but a possibility that, that you just said yes. that I hadn't even, hadn't even occurred to me is that it's just magma all the way down. There's just like the whole interior of the moon is magma, which is bonkers. Well, no, no, I, 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 I might have given the wrong impression. Oh, there's still going to be a layer. There's still a layer at the top of the mantle. Mm, uh, okay, okay. And okay. the question now is, is that layer completely fluid? Got it. Or is it, is it, a, is it sort of just interconnected um, flow through, through interstices um, and voids in a in, in a sponge like sponge like mantle, uh, but it really comes down to. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that's really interesting because it's the same thought that the people thinking about Europa are are having, where they're saying, "Well, we've got this thick ice shell, we've got this global liquid ocean that's underneath the sh thick shell." Are there pockets of water throughout the shell where water is making its way up to the surface, and that's explaining yeah. the resurfacing events and so on? It's just shifted from water to rock, to, and to, I would to, to, to the rock, yes. right? And yeah. I just wonder, uh, like, is there? I'm very interested in Europa as well, from for the for the the, the cryovolcanic you know, aspects of of um, of that, and I'm involved in the Europa Clipper mission, which is which is incredibly exciting and we're looking forward to you know hopefully launching in october next year and boy what a long strange trip that's been um 
uh, there are mechanisms by which a material in the ocean can make its way up to the surface. And that's the exciting you know, proposition uh, for, for the whole mission is that we see that Europa obviously has a, has a, has a young, relatively young surface. So it's being resurf it's being resurfaced geologically quite recently. Um, and the, the trick is to now find locations. One of the, one of the main goals of, of, of the Europa Clipper mission is to find areas which are the youngest, uh, or hopefully, fingers crossed, where actual resurfacing is taking place. So we can actually get a handle on what material is coming up from the oceans. And it tells us what, you know, what the composition and, and the, the, really the habitability of, of, of the Europa Ocean. So yes, yeah, so we have these worlds. These, these worlds with, with oceans underneath the solid crust of rock and of water. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm interested in exploring all of them. Right. And, but I mean, we know that, that Jupiter, the tidal interactions with Jupiter is the source of the energy to all of them. And as well as whatever's happening on Ganymede. Um, sure. And so yeah. do, would lessons learned from the Europa Clipper on what's happening to water give you any insights to what's happening over on Io, I, but happening I to think rock. so, absolutely. Absolutely, it's, it, it comes down to understanding, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. You know, we have this, this complex interplay of transfer of energy from Jupiter to Io, Io to Europa, and Europa to Ganymede through the Laplace resonance. Um, and, you know, to me, to, the best place to understand how tidal heating works and how it's driving the rest of the of the Galilean satellite system, and how it affects how the process of tidal heating affects other bodies in the solar system, which are also in resonances. You know, we have we have Mimas and Tethys in a in a resonance, and and Enceladus and Dione in a resonance you know, around Saturn. Um, the best place to understand that is Io. You know, it's 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 where the tidal heating effect is most pronounced. It's where it's the best place to test the models. I, I've always felt that Io is the best place to go um, to 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 unlock the secrets, if you like, of, of how tidal heating really works. And to really understand that, if you can understand what's happening within Io, it immediately puts massive constraints on what's happening within Europa and then also within Ganymede. Um, I just think Io is the place to go to do this. So let's talk about the exploration of Io because it really feels like it's been understudied at this point. As you say, Voyager was able to make a flyby of the South Pole, but it didn't have the right instruments. Juno was not right. designed to explore Io. It's just they're right. reaching the end of the mission and now they're just sending it closer and closer to Jupiter because why not? Let's see what happens. Um, and it's great. You know, this is, this is, this is wonderful. It's, it's just a real boon to have these data. <laughs> And this isn't the closest flyby, right? There's going to be one in in February where they're going to there's come. A, there's, a, there's a close flyby in at the end of um, December, and there's another one at the end of February. I can't remember which one is the closest, but they're getting the, in. The February one will be a thousand, in. like around in between one and two thousand kilometers away from the surface. Yeah, of, I, have, I actually have the numbers. I actually, have the numbers and presentation I'm giving at AGU next week. Um, the PJ fifty seven, the PJ fifty seven encounter, which is taking place on December the thirtieth. Hey, nice. Um, it'll be at an altitude of about two thousand, two thousand kilometers, two thousand fifty five kilometers at closest approach, um, which gives us you know very high spatial resolution data uh, from both the, the the thermal imager on board, the Juram camera, and uh, and the Juno cam, the Juno cam imager as well. So. Uh, be very exciting to see to see what happens. Um, yeah, um, but you get closer. It's, What's it's the, the February one? The closest, it's, I think the closest it's like flyby since you know, since since the Galileo encounters. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see what, what, what what's seen up close. But it is going to get closer. Like it's going to get. I feel like it's fifteen hundred. You could be right. I mean, I'm trying yeah. to remember what the yeah. what the the PJ. Yeah, I reported on this. Anyway, it's closer. So, um, <laughs> it's closer. It's closer in February. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. In February, so we have to keep our fingers crossed. I've got my, I've got bated breath and fingers crossed and everything crossed in the hopes that um, you know uh, the Juno spacecraft survives a very hostile environment. Uh, again, it wasn't designed. 
It wasn't designed for this, but it's it's a trooper. You know, we keep a, got my hopes up that we'll get some great data back. <laughs> but what would it take to properly explore Io? Um, well, we tried. We tried uh, to to come up with the best mission, uh, okay, the Io Volcano Observer. I was I was also involved. In full disclosure, I was also a co-investigator on that mission. Um, really what we need to explore IO is a mission designed from the start to investigate IO's big questions. And, um, IDO would have been, would have been that mission. Um, so we'll, we'll just have to, you know, it so goes through the selection process. What was the plan? The plan was we put IO into a Juno like orbit. So it's going to make multiple passes of IO from, uh, you know, from, uh, from a uh, high inclination uh, orbit to, to minimize the, the, the radiation dose. Um, but unlike, unlike the instruments on Juno, the instruments on IDO would have been designed for an IO environment. Um, they would have been designed for the unique processes that are taking place on IO in terms of you know, volcanic activity. Uh, they would have been designed to handle the, the extraordinary uh, amount of energy that's emitted from the volcanoes. It's difficult for you imaging the surface of a planet where you've got some parts of it at you know 100 Kelvin, other parts are, of it at temperatures way in excess of 1400. Um, uh, and you know an instruments on board to very carefully measure the shape of Io at different parts of its orbit around um, around Jupiter. Uh, and instruments to to understand the composition of the lavas that are being erupted, which go straight back to what the state of the interior of Io's mantle is, which again starts putting constraints on just how tidal heating is working, and where Io is in the evolving resonance uh, with with the other satellites. So you know it was it was uh, it was uh, it was a tough break not to get selected uh, last time yeah. round, but uh, never say die. That's the way it works. That's the way the game is played. <laughs> right. Well, it, I mean, it's it's just such a it was such a horrible decision. I'm sure for everybody to have to make. Do we want to understand Venus better? It's, do it's we tough. want to understand no, Io, um, or do we want to understand Triton? Yeah. Like, obviously, the answer right. is yes to all all three. Yeah. The answer is yes. Let's do all four. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I write to your congressperson and say, give NASA more more budget. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, how close of a flyby were you hoping to make with that mission? Well, this was going to be multiple flybys. It was going to be in orbit around Jupiter, and it would make repeated flybys of of Io down to you know 100 kilometers. <laughs> 100 kilometers above the surface of Io, and then fly back out. Yeah, 100 kilometers from the surface of Io. Amazing. Yeah. Like, so like that's below the, uh, below we the altitude. Out of some of the eruptions we would have well we but by the time we get down to those altitudes we'd know where they are so uh we, we could uh, we could avoid we could avoid them and if it's at the end of the mission we'd actually deliberately fly through the plume to get information about the plumes themselves right of course <laughs> yeah um you know and it's kind of sad because between uh uh ESA's juice and uh nasa's clipper um we we look at the other three uh, main satellites that IO is left out because both of these missions are going to stay, you know, a long way away from IO um, because of the because of the radiation environment. Um, so, but we will be able to monitor from a distance, but uh, you know, you won't get the you won't get the close up information um, that is really required to, to to know how IO is 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 really working. So, take me farther into the future. Then the IO mission was a somehow returned to the docket and was completed and oh, now you know, yeah. what will happen is it will be proposed again the next time there's an opportunity yes. almost certainly. it's inevitable that it's yeah. going to fly it must uh, and yeah. after this interview yes. we're giving it the the universe today bump <laughs> um but 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 let's talk about like what could come after that like let's say you've you've identified a lot of really interesting surfaces you know places on the surface stuff that you want to learn more about does a right. lander or rover like that's always the next step? Can you yeah, that's, envision that's a lander or rover sort of mission? The next step? Yeah, you know it, it's it's intriguing to put packages down on the surface of Io. Um, the the sort of 
I think my dream shot there would be putting down a sort of a, a globe spanning maybe three or four or more seismic stations, which could be used to, to from seismic activity, really understand mm. the interior structure of Io, from some in situ measurements. The problem with that is, you know, Io is getting racked every day through tidal forces. So there might be just so much background noise and flexing of this entire moon that there might be, you know, difficult to, to, to figure out other, other, um, other, uh, 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 signals from from uh, to give you you know the the path of of, of, of rays through through uh, through Io itself to determine well, that what would be interesting enough on its own though like well, being able be to measure itself. this yeah, this really. you know get re yeah. you know reading this the seismic yeah, activity yeah. of the yeah. of the flexing on the entire moon would be tremendous so like a version of insight but on Io yeah. But the danger with that is it's difficult to, to land something on an airless body. So you have to think about the difficulties of doing that. But the main problem, the main problem is the radiation environment. Because once you put something on the surface of Io, it's subjected to four, four mega rads of radiation a day. And so this thing will have to be rad hardened to a completely insane level for it to just survive long enough to actually send some useful data back. So an in situ exploration of IO, while it's a lot of fun to do, and you can certainly think about things you'd like to do and want to do, you know, technically it, it's, it would be a real challenge, real challenge. And you have to weigh that against the cost and you have to weigh that against the science payoff from it. Do you anticipate that there are lava tubes on IO? Oh, absolutely. And that's one thing that, um, you know, observations have shown even from Galileo where we see lava coming out of the ground at one location and then it seems to disappear and then comes out somewhere else. The implication is that lava tubes formed, uh, and we see indications of this, nothing absolutely definitive. But one of the things that, that IVO would have done uh, is look at these active lava flow fields at Prometheus, at Amirani, at Zamama, these other locations on Io, um, which look so like their contemporaries on Earth, um, which are lava tube fed uh, and look for skylights in the roof of the lava tube where we can see through the skylight to the actual stream of lava moving through the tube and use that as a way of determining what the temperature of the lava is because lava tubes are just so incredibly insulating that the temperature doesn't drop even though you might travel hundred or hundreds of kilometers um, to determine what the, what the, you know, just as an extra constraint on the composition of the lava. Uh, so something that we have yeah, we'd like to do it one day. I guess where I'm going with this, though, is like, could there be ex empty lava tubes where there's yes. no longer active lava flowing yes. through? They've got a collapsed skylight like the ones we see on the moon and Mars. And would being inside one of those lava tubes protect you from Jupiter's radiation? It would to some extent, absolutely. Um, the trick then would be to identify it. And if you did have an asset, you wanted to put it on Io, getting it in, getting it into that tube, you know. Yeah. <coughs> um, the and, difficult know, challenge of skylight, landing. You go into the skylight, you know, but yeah. then you have to move away from from from. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. Right. The difficult challenge of landing fun. on on an airless moon, and, but also right. being able to aim perfectly for the skylight of a lava tube and being able <laughs> yes. to then find yeah. an appropriate landing spot once you get inside. It sounds It would easy. have to be really smart to do that because yeah. it'd have to do it by itself, you know, because it's right. so far away from Earth. Yeah, it's um, on its own. And, you know, missions have been proposed to go into lava tubes on the moon. And I hope um, our colleagues, friends, friends and colleagues here at JPL have, um, have proposed this. And I hope that one day this happens, you know, because it's uh, uh, there's, a, there's a huge amount you can do in a lava tube uh, to understand uh, the volcanology. But in this case, you know, in, in, especially in the lunar case, just by looking at the cross section of material in the roof, um, uh, you can learn a lot about the history of the moon and, and the history of the environment in which these these layers formed.
I mean, but it, I, I know the proposals you're talking about, and I've, I've reported on a bunch of them, and they're all such conservative affairs. Like, we intend to put a lander, a rover, near one of the tubes, and then it's one of the skylights, and then it's going to carefully map the environment right. around the tube, and then it's going to deploy yep. ropes yep. down into the tube and see if, you know, look around what's inside. But, you know, what we're talking about is just YOLO, <laughs> just go straight <laughs> for it. Yeah. Just going straight for it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, you know, you have to be conservative. <laughs> you have to be conservative because by the time you get this thing, whatever it is, to IO, you really spent about four billion dollars, right? So you really yeah. want to get some you really want to get some uh, some return for your investment. And that's important. That's important. You know, yeah, of course, you, of course. You, it, it, the yellow yellow approach is all well and good, or the musk approach, right? We're just going to just keep blowing up until we get it right. I I um, think of it actually as the Japanese as the JAXA approach. So I look at the, a lot of the JAXA missions, and they are just yeah. so bold with their plans for you know shooting an an asteroid with an anti tank weapon, and their plans for landing probes on Phobos with the upcoming uh, MMX mission. It just sounds like like someone clearly is not being super cautious about this. They're just trying to see if they can pull yeah. this off, and I love it. Um, right. So let's talk about the implications for these right. these kinds of moons, these places, and what maybe that tells us about the exoplanets that we're starting to see out there across the universe. When you yeah. think about places like the Trappist system, with all of these planets that are interacting, maybe not in resonance, but at least they're tidally locked. Oh, so they are to... in resonance, so yeah. Oh yeah, it's very exciting. It's very exciting. It's very exciting for a number of reasons. The first is, A, these plants, some of these volcanic, some of these planets are volcanic, okay? Almost, uh, it could dry volcanism. It could drive, could drive volcanism on these planets, um, which is very exciting for me. Uh, uh, but mostly it's it comes down to habitability because you know voyager just you know changed everything when we found that um io was an active world our understanding of how the solar system formed our understanding of how the solar system evolved just changed dramatically and forever when voyager sent back those first observations of active volcanism on io because up to that point, everyone thought the outer solar system worlds, these moons were just, you know, icy, icy, dead, geologically dead ice balls. And this changed everything. Um, and it moved every, it moved the whole question of is there life out there away from the Goldilocks zone, where you have to be at a certain distance from the sun, where you're either, where you're, you're neither too hot or too cold. To anywhere where there's any a, an external force that's heating up the interior of a planet. So what we have is this tidal resonance around Jupiter, and it's the transfer of energy into Io and into Europa and into Ganymede, and it's one of the major things that's keeping the oceans within these worlds oceans. So now we can look at a world like Enceladus, or we can look at a world like Europa, and we can ask ourselves the question, is there an environment within these worlds that is conducive to supporting life. And that's a profound question, which is one of the science drivers that NASA is trying to, is trying to address. It's part of NASA's strategic plan to understand this. Do you think there's a way to get an answer? Yeah, we're doing it. We're doing it right. We're doing it now. We're going to Europa. We're going to Europa with, with Clipper. And Clipper is going to make the sort of investigation of Europa that will hopefully determine um, if the ocean is capable of supporting life. And a similar mission to Enceladus could make the same determination. And once that's, that's been made, then the next trick is to, is to send a lander which will then investigate in situ. And the ultimate goal would then be to, to get through the ice. And it might be kilometers, it's going to be tens of kilometers down and get into the ocean itself 
and see what's there. So this is all part of a very long process that I will probably not see the end of, but it's, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> but you know, um, it's something that, that is all part of a, of, of the big picture to understand just what's happening and well, to try and answer these questions. I mean, there was a big meeting at NASA just in the last month or so looking into trying to get, go under the ice on Europa. Do you, do you think it makes more sense to try and do a lander on Enceladus over Europa just because we know that it has the geysers venting into space? Um, well, that's, you know, uh, you have to look at the science merits of both, of both missions and you have to look at the thing about, you know, the thing about a space mission is you, there are so many uh, competing factors, uh, very simplest, simplest point. You've got, you know, the complexity of it and the potential science return and the cost. And, and the difficulty uh, and the risk that's involved, and uh, you know it's, it's all carefully thought out as you go through the, through through the process. Uh, it's all done at a you know a very high level in, in, in the end. Um, but yes, you know I think you know uh, I think Europa Clipper is 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 the mission to 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 help us understand what's happening at Europa as a pathfinder mission for 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 landers, and then it, it eventually getting through into into the uh, into the interior um into the interior ocean and, and Celadus as well is is a is an absolutely fabulous target it's a bit of a toss-up between the two um you know, i wouldn't be surprised if one of the one of the next missions that nasa selects over the next you know 10 or 15 years will be an Enceladus mission but then <laughs> unfortunately that probably pushes the io mission back again and the triton mission well, you know, well, you know, uh, it, it all depends. You know, if you're going to pick two, if you're going to pick two Venus missions, maybe you'll pick two outer solar system mi missions in the next discovery round, and one of them will be Io, and one of them will be Enceladus. You know, it, it comes down to how good the proposal is, and how uh, feasible, and how you know, reasonable it is, and what the science return is going to be, uh, what the risk is, uh, what the cost is. And, uh, yeah, that's that's the way that's the way it works. You know, I like your chances. Uh, Ashley, what are you obsessed about right now? I'm obsessed about volcanoes all the time. Um, and I'm obsessed about IO and I'm obsessed about what, uh, what Juno is going to send back, uh, what this is going to tell us about uh, IO's volcanism and also what James Webb space telescope, the James Webb space telescope is also going to send back. It's already sent back some incredible spectra of IO. I look forward to seeing what other instruments are going to send back on a slightly longer time, time frame. Some really large telescopes are being built on Earth, which will give us uh, much, much better um, data that we've been able to, uh, to obtain over the last few years, or last few decades. Although they, they themselves, you know, telescopes equipped with adaptive optics like Keck and Gemini, have sent back just jaw-dropping, jaw-dropping observations of volcanism on Io. But with bigger telescopes, we can, we can see Io down to you know, much, much greater uh, spatial scale like the large telescope being built in Chile at the moment. European Southern Observatory. I forget what, right. exactly what it's called. What, what the oh, the extremely called. large telescope? It's PLT. a whopper. Yeah, it's 39 meters. Yes, the extra large telescope. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, huge. Uh, it, and we'll see if the 30 meter telescope where, where, where that gets built as well. Yeah, the well, the Magellan gets built in the Southern Hemisphere as well. And then hopefully yeah. the 30 meter telescope gets built. Yeah. Uh, it'll either end yes. up in somewhere in Hawaii so, or the but again, you know, they, they all have an opportunity to uh, to uh, uh, to look at IO. That's one of the many targets out there, um, and uh, and we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Well, Ashley, thank you so much Exciting for taking time. the time to chat with me today, and and good luck with uh, uh, the option, the next flybys of IO with Juno. I hope you <laughs> are able to increase the count by. Yes, I, I hope know, so. I don't know. Yes, uh, or at least you understand doesn't. better what we've seen already. Yeah, and uh, you know, go Juno. Uh, I wish, I wish the, uh, I wish the Juno project and the Juno team members, and the Jiran members, and the Juno Cam members, the very, very best of luck. Yeah, safe flight. Safe flight. I'm going to talk about IO some more, but first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Hey Twyla, Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiplin, Modzo, George, David Gilton, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. 
and all of our other supporters on Patreon. From what you can tell, um, I'm pretty into IO and Ashley is really into IO. It's amazing actually to find somebody who does this as their day job and clearly is completely obsessed about this world. And it's one of these places where we have these images, we see kind of what the place looks like, we've had some close flybys, but it just hasn't been properly studied the way the other places in the solar system have. And it's really starting to dawn on me how you've got these places across the solar system that are they're the same, but they're just different by phase. When you think about Earth, we have the rock of the planet, we have the surface, we have water, we have clouds. But when you shift to a place like Pluto, then suddenly the rocks are made of ice, the glaciers are made of methane and ammonia, and it has a thin atmosphere. And when you go to a place like Io, whatever was water is now just taken up by volcanoes. And so, the laws of physics find a way to accomplish anything. Anyway, needless to say, I'm really excited about IO and I really hope that we're able to see a mission back there. Now, I've done some interviews, not about IO, but Europa, both about the ideas on what it might take to be able to send a mission under the ice on IO, as well as just ways that we can better understand IO and Enceladus and other worlds in general. So, here's some more links to some other interviews. All right. We'll see you next time.